I just had a conversation earlier today where it was a, well, gosh, I'm so the, the, the hiring manager needs the skill so bad. They're willing to take anything and that wrecks a, a, an environment, right? Right. Well, and, and so I have a friend at New Mexico State University named Becky Perez, who did her dissertation on companies being drawn to more narcissistic types when they're failing when they're swirling the drain, the desperation that comes with. Uh, and it's human nature that if you are going down a very, very a counterproductive road, things are dire. Uh, who are you going to take as your next leader? You're going to take somebody that's going to be like, oh, well, you know, you're in a bad situation. I don't know what's going to happen. Or the guy that's going to, you know, I'm Superman and I'm going to save you any means necessary. Right. But the problem with that, Wes, is as as you perceive this talent, this skill, you make a Faustian bargain right? If the person is toxic. And so unfortunately, perceived talent is the Trojan horse that sneaks abuse into an organization. Yeah. And so many of the owners that we interact with, so many of the folks that I've, I've, I've done any coaching relationships with where they've got an issue, I've said, hey, we, we can't, we've got to separate the two things. It's not about I like or I dislike the person. We've got to address the behavior. I right. can, in fact, say, hey, I love you, but your behavior has violated the policy X number of times. And if I went through the first and the second and the third step in the dis disciplinary process, it might be a conversation to where I say, I love you, but you don't get to work here anymore. Right. And, and I think people have to understand um, in these tough situations um, that visionary leadership, abusive leadership, while they are unrelated, can be packaged in the same individual. And unfortunately, unfortunately you now have to make a, a, a collective decision about the whole package. You don't get to disembody the person's talent from their behavior. And the vision of one could mean the toxicity of 100. Are you really willing to take that trade off? Right. Oh. And I think that's where that needs to be addressed directly through HR channels, through proper channels. And those people need to be removed regardless of the vision. And I, I was having a conversation with somebody recently about that. Um, and, and, you know, we were talking about, well, the visionary leadership now belongs to somebody else and we're going to miss that. Yes, but so does the toxicity. And so you have to understand that what could be a move forward in, in vision, strategy, um, talent, productivity could be three steps backward in terms of culture, health, and mental yeah. health of your workers. Yeah. It came into that. I, I I know I've written on it. I don't remember if it was in What's Killing Your Profitability at all was down to leadership or it was some other lesson I did. But I give an example. I've seen a couple different places where highly skilled, highly effective folks in the roles were in the supervisory or manager role. But the folks, they, they had a revolving door un, in the in the chain underneath them. And, and the new folks, there was never any hope of getting somebody up to speed because by the time they were getting somewhat skilled, gosh, the toxicity toxicity drove them away. And right. the argument I always make is, which which do you need? This person someday is probably going to leave or die, one or the other. Right. We've right. got nobody because they're running everybody else off. Right. And so there are several examples um, through through the course of my conversations with leaders and workers that I can think of where the individual is locked into the position and the employees are, are in a revolving door. And what people, what upper management generally fails to see is that um, you know the turnover is costly at all forms, right? You to not have that culture and not have that continuity in workers, especially in an industry where turnover is unexpected, right? I mean, restaurants, bars, you expect a certain level of turnover as kids, college kids, for example, that work there, move on, graduate, things like that. It's not so damaging as an organization where turnover really is 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 damaging, right? And so you have this toxic leadership and people are moving away, um, taking their skills elsewhere. Um, but what ends up happening, Wes, is a lot of times the, the toxic uh, leaders or supervisors or whatever, they've already prepped or groomed the upper management. And that's often why they're not removed. So in a conversation I had with a consultant uh, many years ago in Brazil, he was telling me that he worked with an organization. He was trying to tell them, look, you know, you you have this this person that needs to be removed. And they said, yeah, no, we think the workers are just being sensitive. Right. Because he went to the top management initially and inoculated them to the complaints. they were gonna. He said, look, I'm going to do my job. I'm going to make the trains run on time. I may have to crack some skulls to do it. And because he was in with the upper management, top management team, they refused to remove him because they perceived these complaints that started to come in as evidence of him doing his job, 
Does that make sense? It, it does make sense. And unfortunately, makes sense. I should say. Oh, yeah. hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent makes sense. And unfortunately, I mean, you're right. I mean, that's a piece that I, I hammer all the time. The cost of turnover is huge. I mean, I, all the stats I see are anywhere from half of someone's annual salary, and that's usually an entry level position, to as much as five times. And that that executive, that higher level manager, it can cost five times their annual salary to replace them, get the new person spun up, all the different things, and. So often, the executives, the, the bean counters, if you will, sorry for any bean counters out there, um, <laughs> yeah. it, they're, they're not seeing the indirect cost. They're only looking at here's what the ad cost, here's what the sign-on bonus costs, and so on. And they're missing some of the things that are, I'm not going to use the word intangible. I'm going to say they're they're harder to, to make them tangible. That's right. I, I'd like to add, actually, I, I was a bartender for many years, and I started bartending in, in Tucson, Arizona. And there was a bar that I signed on for. I was very excited to get the job. Um, and the, the owner of the bar um, was a very bad, bad leader and not a nice guy. So he had a reputation for putting the hammer down on his bartenders. The women bartenders had to hug him before their shifts. It was a really creepy situation. And he set up a situation behind the bar where he had me taking the beer orders, but other bartenders would take the drink orders, which made no sense because you'd have somebody waiting in line, 10 people come up and I'll say, well, I can get your beer, but you got to go get back in line to get your Long Island iced tea. It made no sense. So at the end of the night, I went up and I said, look, this situation created awkwardness. I explained my, I was fired the next day. I said, get new bartenders. Um, and his bar went under. But that's an example of even an industry where it's it's designed to accommodate for turnover. High turnover, you're going to drive your business underground, right? Into the ground, I should say. Yeah. And those, it, it, interestingly enough, those are two chapters that I wrote about in, in my last book. And I'm going to at some point write a book about there's no profit if we don't have people. Now, that's right. With this conversation, one of the things after you and I initially spoke and set this up, I, I saw you share something on LinkedIn that showed it was called the narcissistic abuse cycle. Mm -hmm. And if you're willing, kind of talk about that a little bit, share how you've seen it impact work environment when that person in the leadership role. And I, I, Dan, I absolutely refuse to call that person a leader because, right. hey, sitting in the car, um, the, the garage don't make me a car. Right. Being in the role, don't make him a leader it, okay. it, when they're exhibiting that behavior that that was detailed in that cycle. Mm -hmm. Well, in order to answer where that came from, I have to give a little background on the study of these personalities, the dark triad, Machiavellianism, psychopathy, narcissism. Mm -hmm. When I first started studying them, I went back and I actually read Nicola Machiavelli. I actually read Sun Tzu and the Art of War because I wanted to try to get into the headspace of Christie and Geis and where they were coming from in developing this construct. And one of the things that Machiavelli harped on in his book was don't you give the masses enough that they don't revolt give the masses give the people what they need to keep them just satisfied right because revolution is the most dangerous thing to besides this, the second in command is one of the most dangerous things to a leader's power and i think in a one-on-one -on -one relationship that same analogy holds for how some of these folks think about this they're going to give you the charm they're going to give you the honeymoon periods they're going to give you the love in a romantic relationship just enough so that you tolerate the abuse. And then you start to question your own judgment, your decisions, and what caused that abuse, right? Because he, she, he, they were so sweet last night, you know, got so thoughtful. So is it me, right? Because if it was abuse all the time, nobody would put up with it. So now extrapolating back to the business world, right? If you have a leader who is, let's say, face traces of narcissism, right? Um, they may lavishly praise, compliment, do something in front of you. It's like, damn, that, wow, he really put me up on a pedestal there. But make no mistake, if the person fits this pattern and you become a liability, you become a problem, you become something that embarrasses them, they have no hesitation to throw you under the bus because you are pawns in their ultimate game of number one being important. So ultimately, what you end up doing is dealing with this back and forth whiplash in in a relationship especially with a narcissistic individual where you're punctuated your abuse is punctuated with these moments of praise um compliments uh charm and it's a cycle because it, it keeps you there but it also allows them to do the things they feel like they have to do to maintain their power and control um so moving on beyond abuse manipulation functions in the same thing